So I would want parents to understand that that is a very profound disturbance in a person's behavior. But it arises out of neurology and genetics, and out of this is going to come a very important view of what to do about this disorder. The first thing this is going to mean is to stop teaching so many damn skills. Because you're approaching this child as if he's stupid, right? Oh, he doesn't have any friends. I guess he doesn't know social skills, so we'll take him down to the local clinic and we'll enroll him in a 12-week social skills camp about which we'll probably pay 50 to to $100 a session. Or we'll send him to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan where there's a nice summer social skills camp that was advertised in Chad's Attention Magazine. There is. It's probably a very nice camp. I don't mean to belittle it. I'm just telling you it will do no good, right? <laughs> <laughs> well... Now, let's understand something. I might want to send a child to camp just to have fun, right? It's part of the quality of life. Go, have a nice summer. But if I'm sending you to camp with the belief that you're going to come back a person with better social skills, you are sadly mistaken. Right? So we have got to stop putting all the eggs in the skill training basket because that's not where the problem is. Right? We have got to spend more time changing the point of performance. The point of performance is where you should be using what you know, and you're not. And the only way to treat a performance disorder is to change that point. This means that all treatment, if it is going to work at all, must be at the point of performance, the place in your life where you're not using what you already know. And if the intervention isn't done there, it's useless. That has been a major finding of the last decade. The only treatments that work are treatments that modify those natural points in the environment where the problems are occurring. And if those aren't modified, nothing done away from that site will do anything. So you can do pull-out services. You can go to summer or to uh, social skills camps. You can go to special ed. You can come and see me for once a week for psychotherapy. And everything I just said will have no generalization or maintenance. Won't go anywhere. Won't even leave this room. Howard Abakoff tells a beautiful story of the social skills group he ran, and on the day they covered anger management and sharing, he opened the door to the room and there was a fist fight in the hall by the elevator <laughs> over who was going to push the button. So much for your anger management, right? You see what happens? You were focusing on knowledge. Oh, let me teach you how to share and cooperate. And you missed the point. This is not information deficit disorder. Right. This is performance deficit disorder. So you've got to change those points of performance. If he has no friends on the playground, you're going to have to do something at that school. If you've got trouble with homework, it's the kitchen table, honey. It's not my office. We need to rearrange where the homework is being done to help them show what they know. As I've already said, this point of view also then makes us look very differently at psychopharmacology as a form of neurogenetic treatment. Now, everything I have just said could be used by any parent to come up to me and say, my child got thrown out of school yesterday for some misbehavior. Would you please go to school and get him reinstated? He should not be held accountable for these consequences, right? Because after all, didn't you just say it's a neurogenetic disorder? So let me help you understand something about what I've just said. ADHD does not cause a problem with consequences. The problem is with time. It was the delay to the consequence that disabled you which means that I'm going to do the opposite of what this mother is asking. Increase accountability, not decrease it. Increase the frequency, immediacy, the salience, and the timing of consequences. People with ADHD need more accountability, not no accountability. In fact, this view of ADHD as an executive disorder would tell you that if you argue for no accountability, you will make this disorder worse, not better, because the problem is the delay and all natural consequences of any importance are delayed. What does that mean? We are going to have to use behavioral treatments, the BMOD programs, the tokens, the charts, the cards, the Smurf stickers, whatever. What is their purpose? Their purpose is not to teach. That is a misnomer, if you will. Their purpose is to sprinkle artificial consequences into these delays in the natural environment in order to increase your accountability. So they're not teaching anything. They are making up for the accountability deficit disorder. BMOD does not teach anything to ADHD children, really. 
what it does is improve the motivation to show what you know. By making you more accountable, more often, around you, you have less ADHD. By excusing you from the consequences, you'll be more ADHD. So I want you to understand something. There are two reasons why we would tell you as a family to do behavior modification. One is instructional. This is why we teach families of autistic and mentally retarded children behavior modification, to teach their children things they don't know. But the second purpose you would do BMOD for has nothing to do with instruction. It's motivational, to make up for the motivation deficit disorder that this disorder produces. And so if you do BMOD for its motivational value, you can't stop it. Because if you pull it, you've pulled the motivation. If you do BMOD for its instructional purpose, you can pull it. Because once they've acquired the skill, they'll use the skill and you don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, do you see a, a contrast here? Most parents and nearly all teachers I deal with believe that BMOD is for instructional value. That's why we do it for ADHD, which is why whenever you go into a school and you try to teach a teacher to set up a token system, the first question out of his mouth is, how long do I have to do this? When will he internalize the program? And my answer is, never. <laughs> as long as he's in your class, you will have to arrange artificial consequences to replace the delayed ones. And if you don't do that, he will not work for you. So I want you to think about token systems and star charts and all behavior modification as being equivalent to a ramp that comes into this building. That ramp is there to make people who are physically disabled less motorically impaired. They can get into the building in their wheelchairs or whatever other devices they're using. But would you ever say to such a person, after 30 days of entering this building successfully using the ramp, <laughs> you know, you know the punchline, right? Can I take the ramp away? Have they internalized the ramp? Well, of course not. The ramp was never for teaching, right? The ramp is a prosthesis. A prosthesis is an artificial means of reducing the disabling consequences of your disorder. It is not to train you up into anything. No amount of using a ramp is going to take the ramp away. And no amount of BMOD is going to take the BMOD away. These individuals will always need more frequent consequences around them than will other people in order to perform at the same level. It's just a general corollary of ADHD. So what else have we learned about ADHD? Well, if all treatment is at that point of performance, and if at that point of performance I'm trying to arrange a prosthesis, a prosthetic environment, to reduce the impairment from the disability, right, then it means that the caregivers are the most important people in the treatment plan, the parents and the teachers. It is their compassion for disabled people and their willingness to make these prosthetic accommodations that is the heart of any successful intervention. And absent that compassion, no amount of quality in a good professional or therapist is going to change that. You have to make those people stakeholders. You've got to get them invested. And if they're not, you're in trouble. It doesn't matter how good a clinician you are. So it's best to look at ADHD. I would be telling these families in my office, like we look at diabetes, largely a chronic disorder. And our goal is to manage it, to create a reduction in the symptoms the purpose of which is the avoidance of secondary harm. We do not treat diabetes to get rid of it. We treat it to prevent what happens to you if you don't manage your diabetes, because you will go blind, and your heart muscle will atrophy, and you are at risk for sudden death, and you will get gangrene, and you may have your toes or fingers or other appendages eventually amputated if we do not manage your insulin levels. That is what we try to prevent. But no amount of treating diabetes is ever designed to get rid of the diabetes. And I think ADHD is a very good analogy. I think we manage ADHD to prevent the secondary harms, which I'm about to show you. We don't manage ADHD to get rid of it. We manage it so that you don't experience those more heinous consequences.